All right. Well, thank you very much again to the, the Brain Box guys and to, to Rory for inviting me along today. Um, very, very happy to be here to, to have a bit of a chat about combining transcranial magnetic stimulation with electroencephalography, so TMS and EEG. So I thought what I'd do today is uh, give just a bit of a general overview of, of where, I guess, I, I mean, uh, where I think the, the field is, is at currently, some of the, the, the ways in which the, the combination of, of TMS and EG has been used over the last several years. And then I guess um, looking at some of the, the, the key assumptions that underlie the technique, and then maybe having a bit of a review of, of some recent findings that have sort of, I guess, made us maybe question uh, just exactly how well we're actually doing it at meeting some of those assumptions and, and whether we need to uh, take those into account a little bit more and where we're designing and our TMS. To get started, um, I thought we could just have a bit of a chat about why we would actually want to combine TMS and EEG. And, and just for those of you, I, I sort of assume that most of you are f familiar with, uh, with TMS and how it works, but very quickly, uh, TMS is a non-invasive method uh, that allows us to, to activate cortical neurons using the, the principles of electromagnetic induction. So uh, briefly, we can apply a very fast time, very mag magnetic field, which creates a uh, sorry, electric field, which creates a perpendicular magnetic field that can pass through the scalp and can activate um, or cause neurons that are underlying uh, the, our, our coil to, to fire in response to the stimulation. So this, is, uh, this technique has been around for, for over 30 years now and has been used extensively in, in a range of different fields. Um, in terms of understanding how TMS actually works, one of the, the, the areas that I guess has, has really been used the most extensively is to stimulate the, the primary motor cortex and then record the output from that stimulation uh, in the form of the response of the target muscle from the, the area which, uh, that is controlled by the area which is stimulating. So typically this is, is done for small hand muscles and the response uh, is known as a, as a motor evoke potential or MEP. And this is recorded as uh, the electromyographic response of the muscle. Um, and typically the, the size of, of this MEP response, it, it gives a general indication of the, the excitability of the corticomotor system. So we can use the, the size of this, uh, this MEP to get a fairly indirect measure of the excitability of the cortex. And we've learned a lot about how PMS interacts with cortical circuits from this technique. So that we know that it, it evokes um, periods of, of facilitation and inhibition following the pulse. We know that if we apply trains of these pulses that we can, occur, uh, we can cause some kind of plastic changes to occur within the organisation of these circuits. And we really, uh, really have, have learned an enormous amount. But one of the major limitations for, for the, the motor system, using the motor system as the, the, the output recording from, from TMS is that we are in, inherently limited to, to stimulating and recording from the motor system. So um, put another way, this means that we can't use this same approach to understand how the stimulation interacts with an area like the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, which doesn't um, evoke a motor output uh, easily. So the, the idea behind TMS EEG is to, to actually use EEG as our output recording of the, the TMS response. So the idea here is, is actually quite simple uh, in that EEG uh, records the, the synchronous activity of large populations of neurons. And, you know, the EEG generally, EEG electrodes sit quite uh, close to the scalp. So the idea is that we can simply place the TMS coil over the EEG electrodes, stimulate the, um, our cortical circuits or networks, and then record the brain's response to the stimulation using the, the EEG as the output. So when we do this, uh, we record uh, these EEG uh, recordings across 
following brain regions that they are top of. And what we see is after giving a TMS pulse, and here this is indicated by the vertical line in the, the graphs, we see that we cause synchronized um, periods of synchronized brain activity following the pulse. Now, importantly, when we are recording the response with EEG, we get um, a readout, I guess, of the more or less the whole brain's response to the stimulation. So we're no longer locked to just understanding the response from a single region, but we get both um, a spatial aspect and a temporal aspect of the, the brain's response to stimulation. So two things become quite evident. One is a, a single pulse at, at, a, at a, a reasonably high intensity can cause lasting changes that that, um, that lasts for at least 300 milliseconds and in some cases much longer than that. Um, well, we see that the response to the stimulation isn't limited to, to where we stimulate. So on the left-hand plot here, I've, I've plotted a response to stimulation of the left motor cortex. And on the right-hand side, I've plotted the response to the left dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. So we see that generally the very early response seems to um, occur near where we've stimulated but then as, the, as time goes on, we can record responses from actually quite a number of different, different brain regions. So um, using EEG as our, our readout, we now have quite a different perspective on how TMS is, is interacting with, uh, with the brain. So the way I showed you is looking at um, the, the average response across um, a scalp recording of around 60 electrodes, looking and um, averaging across trials in the time domain. We can also record EEG in the frequency domain as well. So instead of conceptualizing the, uh, the responses and evoke potential, we can conceptualize it more as a stimulated oscillation or, or possibly the entrainment of ongoing oscillations. And how we do this gives us different, um, different types of information. So if we take the, the frequency response of the, um, the average or the evoked response um, shown here on the left hand side, we get uh, all the, the activity with evoke that's highly time locked to the TMS pulse. However, if we do the frequency decomposition at the single trial level, we can then, uh, we're then sensitive to oscillations that aren't necessarily highly time locked to the, to the, to the TMS pulse, also called induced oscillations. So when we do this, um, and this is an example here from uh, the, the previous slide, converting the, the DLPFC signal into the time frequency domain, we see that um, the, 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 the response to TMS includes both high frequency responses, so fast responses, and low frequency um, oscillatory responses as well. So um, a number of people, I guess, have looked at how sensitive these DG responses are to, to different um, manipulations. So one of the, I guess, the, the key things to, to understand is how reproducible these um, TMS evoke responses are. And it turns out that they're actually very reproducible across time and, and tend to be very similar um, within a session, very similar if you take the person out of the, the lab and bring them back a week later and provide the, the same stimulation. And that similarity can last for actually, or it is quite strong over fairly long periods of time. However, the, the evoke responses are also very sensitive to, to changes in our TMS parameters. So for example, the responses can change quite markedly if we change the, the coil angle. Uh, the responses change if we change the, the stimulation with, with uh, the intensity with which we're giving the stimulation. And the, the evoke responses are also quite, quite sensitive to the, the site of stimulation as well. So this all suggests that while the, the responses, if all of the experimental factors are held constant, are very reproducible, that they're also very sensitive to changes in the way that we give the stimulation. Um, a number of uh, people have provided uh, different uh, different drugs to try and understand how sensitive these TMS evoked DG responses are to changes in neurotransmission. So Isabella Cromoli has done a number of drug studies. This one here looking at um, three different GABA 
A receptor agonists. So, um, uh, and what uh, Isabella found in, in her studies here was that all of these GABA A receptor agonists tended to change the, sim the signal in a similar way with uh, increases in the, the size of the response in certain time regions um, and decreases in others. In contrast, uh, when she provided baclofen, which is a, a, an agonist for um, a different type of GABA receptor, the GABA B receptor, uh, she found that this changed a uh, changed the responses over a different time period. So these findings sort of suggested that the um, the, the evoked responses are, are sensitive to to GABA ergic neurotransmission and were differentially sensitive to to either changes to the GABA A receptive neurotransmission or GABA B receptive neurotransmission. Um, it doesn't seem to be the case that um, that the, the evoked responses are changes to, to all neurotransmitter systems. So there's so some recent work that, um, that I've undertaken uh, with the, the Zeeman group looking at using dextromethorphan, which is uh, does a number of things, but one of the things that, that, that it uh, blocks is NMDA receptors, so excitatory neurotransmission. Um, and here, providing stimulation to frontal or parietal regions, there didn't seem to be any any consistent large changes in, in the evoked responses. So suggesting that maybe these responses are, are not actually uh, quite so sensitive to, to changes in, in certain types of excitatory neurotransmission. So um, other authors have used this technique to understand uh, some biophysical properties of, of different cortical regions by stimulating those uh, different regions and looking at how the response to those regions uh, differs. So one, uh, one uh, very uh, well-cited example of this is from uh, Mario Rossanova and uh, Marcello Massimini and their group where they stimulated either an occipital region, a parietal region or a frontal region. And then they measured the oscillatory response to those regions and noted that uh, when stimulating occipital regions, that the response tended to, to, to result in a, a lower frequency oscillation that dominated when moving forward in the brain to parietal regions, the, that oscillatory response became faster. And when moving further forward again, that oscillatory response became faster again. So this is suggesting that the different brain regions respond uh, differently when we pulse them with, with TMS. So looking at the responses of single areas, more recently people have, have uh, started looking at uh, the brain's response to entire networks. So here uh, the authors have uh, converted the, the scalp signal into source space using uh, source reconstruction and then measured where in the brain the response was coming from at different points. Here, what the authors did was stimulated two parietal regions that neighbour each other, but belong to two separate cortical networks. So here, a network representing um, a connectivity across different regions. And what the authors found here is that when they stimulated uh, a region that sat within the, the dorsal attention network, so this, um, this region represented in green here, that the, the size of the response tended uh, within that network tended to be larger. Um, and when stimulating uh, a neighbouring area that was, had a different connectivity profile, the default mode network, that the response when stimulating that region tended to be larger within that network versus the other region, suggesting that uh, TMS can be used to target uh, specific networks. So the response to TMS has also been used to, to assess changes in the, the brain across different brain states. So one of the, the classic examples of this, again, from Marcello Massimini's group, was looking at how the, the brain's response to TMS changes as people uh, go through different stages of, uh, of wakefulness through to, through to non-REM sleep. So what they found was that the, the EEG readout after providing TMS changed quite substantially in, its, um, in both the, the frequency content and the spatial content um, as people became more asleep. Uh, move through the different stages of sleep. 
so here the authors uh, interpreted that as, as showing uh, differences in the the capacity of the the brain to uh, changes in the connectivity of the brain through through different brain states. So they also use probe more subtle changes in brain states. So in this work here uh, by Jim Herring uh, with with Till Bergman, uh, the the authors looked at how responses to the occipital cortex changed when people were either attending to a visual stimulus or attending to an auditory stimulus. So here, um, two different visual systems, uh, sorry, two different um, attentional states. So what they found was that the, the early response over occipital regions tended to be larger when, when individuals were attending to visual stimuli, which uh, engaged the occipital regions compared to when they were attending to auditory stimuli, which obviously involve um, auditory regions. And they also found that the, the oscillatory response to the TMS changed as well, in that the, when uh, individuals were attending to, to visual stimuli, the TMS actually evoked a much longer alpha oscillation um, that, that lasted for, for more cycles than when they attended to uh to to auditory stimuli so all of these findings suggest that the the occipital region changes in its um in its excitability and its properties when it's uh, when it's actively engaged in an attentional task so some other applications and and the, these examples here are from um from Sung Wook Chung and, and from Aaron Hill, who were PhD students uh, who uh, were uh, co-supervised with Paul Fitzgerald and, and Hoy. Um, here, Sung and, and Aaron were, were interested in trying to understand how different neuromodulatory brain stimulation paradigms uh, interacted with prefrontal circuits. So Sung was particularly interested in theta burst stimulation, which is a, a neuromodulatory uh, paradigm which has been shown to, to alter cortical excitability in the motor system. So Sung applied theta burst stimulation to the, the prefrontal cortex and then used TMS EEG before and after the stimulation to see how the brain's response to the, the stimulation changed. And what he found was that um, with ITBS, certain uh, peaks of the, the, the evoked response tended to, to get larger. Um, with CTBS, the, the responses, um, so typically this decreases cortical excitability in the motor system, um, but he didn't find any strong changes in the prefrontal system with this paradigm. And when compared to, to Sham, he, he typically um, found that particularly this peak around the N120, N100, N120 tended to change. Aaron uh, looked at a different form of neuromodulatory brain stimulation. So he looked at um, transcranial direct current stimulation. So this involves passing um, a very weak current across the brain, uh, which is thought to, to alter um, neuronal firing rates and induce plasticity in, that, plasticity in that way. So Aaron compared two different ways of, of providing transcranial direct current stimulation. So um, a standard bipolar montage or a, a, another form where you use a more density, more focal stimulation. And what Aaron found was that, uh, that again, certain aspects of the, the prefrontal uh, TMS evoked response changed. In this case, a slightly different uh, peak um, around the P60, which tended to change both following bipolar and uh, and high density TDCS, but across a slightly different time range. So another very common use for, for TMS evoked, uh, uh, for, for TMS EEG is to, to measure or to try and assess pathophysiological changes that occur with different brain disorders. So there's a number of these, uh, these examples, but, but one I think which is particularly interesting, um, again, from Marcello Massimini and Mario Rossanova's group um, has been uh, the, the use in, in uh, disorders of consciousness. So uh, here the, the team devised a, a new metric for trying to understand the, the complexity of the, the response to stimulation, um, which they call the, the per perturbational complexity index. So this looks um, at how far and wide the brain's response to, to the stimulation ranges. 
and then tries to to distill that um, th that activity down to a to a single number, uh, the PCI number which you see here. And across a number of studies, what their their team has found is that um, that when moving into different levels of consciousness, so either um, during sleep or under different uh, anaesthetics, uh, that PCI decreases quite substantially. And uh, what they then see, um, and, and actually to the point where you can pretty much differentiate people from being either in a state of wakefulness or in a state of, of, of unconsciousness or, or anaesthesia. So what the team then did was applied this to, to people who had, un, um, who had various different disorders of consciousness. Um, and I, the most striking finding here was the, the difference between people who are in a vegetative state, so who um, are still alive and generally um, alive due to, a, due to assistance, um, but, but are effectively uh, don't have any, uh, any functioning brain activity versus people who suffer from locked-in syndrome, which is where the, the brain is still active and people are, are likely still conscious, but they're, they're not actually able to communicate um, due to the, the peripheral systems uh, not working properly. And here, using the, the perturbational complexity index, the team were actually able to nearly entirely differentiate these, these, uh, these patients who uh, on, on observation can be very, very difficult to, to differentiate. So this is uh, potentially quite a, has the, the potential as a useful clinical technique for determining whether someone um, has locked in syndrome and is potentially still conscious versus someone who is um, effectively brain dead. So um, this is one example from, from its use in, in, in clinical settings and um, Sarah Tremblay, undertook what must be described as a real Herculean uh, review recently. Looked at all of the different questions TMS EG has been, review, uh, been used for, um, and it's been used in, in over 12 different brain disorders um, in psychiatry and neurology. And um, I'd recommend anyone who's interested in the clinical use of TMS EG to check out Sarah's paper. It, it really is a very comprehensive overview of, of all of the, the, the current status of, of um, the clinical use of, of TMSEG. Okay, so that was just a, a very quick list of um, examples of, of how TMSEG is currently being used and, and some of the, the interesting questions, I guess, that, that people are trying to answer uh, by using TMSEG. So I thought now I'd just quickly um, overview, I guess, the, the two main ways in which uh, TMS EG is currently used. And, and some of the, I really wanted to outline and, and lay out some of the assumptions that underlie those techniques, because often uh, these, these assumptions, I guess, aren't always clearly stated. And I think they have some quite important implications. So the first approach is, I guess, in, in TMS research. So for people that are trying to understand the, the physiology of brain stimulation and the physiology of TMS. And in this instance, um, TMS EG is used, I guess, to answer questions like, how does the brain respond to TMS? So here we're not really necessarily interested specifically on um, what the, the, the brain response is, is representing, but we're just interested to see if we stimulate the brain, how does it actually respond to the stimulation? So the second approach is a little bit more directed and I, I call this here uh, perturbation research. So here it's a little bit more specific. So in this instance, people often want to answer the question, how does region X or network Y respond to, to TMS? So here, I guess they're using the targeted ability of TMS to try and probe certain cortical circuits or certain, certain brain networks and understand how they might respond uh, to the stimulation under different conditions. And in that way, learn something about that brain region or that brain network and its responsiveness. So I think um, there, there are two sort of key assumptions to, to, these, uh, to these methods. So while the two um, are quite closely related, there is a key difference, I think, and then that difference being that uh, with the, the perturbation research approach, we're expecting quite a specific response to the brain stimulate, uh, to, to TMS. 
with the TMS research response, we're a little bit more agnostic as to, to where the activity might be coming from, whether it's actually from TMS interacting with the cortical circuits or whether it's from TMS interacting with, uh, with sensory systems or some other physiological uh, mechanism. But regardless, in, in using both approaches, the, the underlying assumption is that the brain signals that we're recording with EEG can be reliably recovered from any artifacts that occur along with TMS that, um, that might affect our EEG recordings. However, with the, the specificity of the, the perturbational approach, there is an additional assumption. And that additional assumption is that the brain signal uh, in EEG that we're recording only occurs as a result of the TMS interaction um, with the, the targeted cortical region or the, the, or the regions that are connected to that region that's been stimulated. So what I thought I'd do now is just spend a little bit of time um, going through and, and talking about these assumptions and I guess the, the work that has been done previously to, to, to see how well these assumptions hold up. And, and some more recent research, I guess, that has started to maybe suggest that we perhaps need to, to rethink how well we're doing at addressing some of these assumptions uh, and, and potentially change the way in which we uh, are providing um, our TMS EG research. So looking first at assumption one. So, can we recover brain signals from, from TMS EG recordings? Now, um, for those of you who have had any, uh, any uh, attempts at doing TMS EG, you, you'll know that this is really, really challenging because TMS actually induces quite a number of artifacts in EG recordings that, that can really um, destroy the signal. And this is just um, a, an old example that, that sort of, I guess, really highlights why TMS EG wasn't done earlier. Um, it is incredibly challenging. And with a lot of the older um, style amplifiers, EG amplifiers, the TMS pulse actually used to saturate the amplifiers. So you can sort of see that um, as an example here where the, the stimulation has caused huge drifts in the, the signal. It's caused it to clip in various regions. And in, um, in certain recording electrodes here, the, the signal is not actually usable for, for several seconds after the stimulation. So um, in a lot of the older EG amplifiers, you really couldn't actually get any early responses to stimulation because the, the amplifiers um, were, were knocked outside of their ranges for, for quite a long time. So um, Risto Elmoniemi and his team came up with a way around this where they designed what's called a sample and hold circuit, which actually pinned the EG amplifiers for a brief period around uh, when the, the TMS pulse was occurring. Um, and this um, prevented the amplifiers from being knocked outside of their, their operating ranges and allowed, it, and allowed uh, EEG signals to be recorded very soon after the pulse, so within um, several milliseconds after the pulse. And this circumvented this, um, this issue of, of the amplifiers being, being, I guess, overrun by the TMS pulse. So the sample and hold circuit, I guess, was um, a very nice uh, hardware approach to, to this problem and was kind of the, the gold standard for a number of years. Um, in the ensuing decade or so, um, EEG amplifier technology improved quite substantially. Uh, in particular, the, uh, the operating ranges of the amplifiers increased, which meant that, uh, that they were no longer being uh, knocked outside of their operating ranges by the large TMS pulse artifact, and they could actually much better record that pulse artifact um, and, and actually uh, be able to, to deal with that. And on top of that, um, amplifiers were designed that allowed DC recordings as well. And this meant that you didn't need to use filters uh, with your, uh, with or high pass filters with your, um, with your recordings that could also interact with the TMS pulses. And this is just some work that we did um, stimulating some melons sort of showing that, you know, using these, these high range amplifiers that you actually can characterize the, the TMS pulse artifact quite well and can get back to a, a sensible operating range within the, the order of, of several milliseconds after the TMS pulse. Um, so when we actually applied uh, the stimulation uh, in humans using these, these amplifier types, we found that, you know, in certain people that you could record um, or look like quite sensible looking brain responses just in the raw EEG recordings without any processing um, at all. So quite soon after the, the, the TMS pulse. However, in some individuals, the, the responses look quite different. And again, you saw these really, really large 
um, responses that that didn't seem to be sort of within the, the the regular range of what you would expect for for EEG responses to to stimulation. Um, and, and I, I guess we, we um, along with others, were, were a little bit um, concerned about what those those very early responses potentially represented. And when you sort of zoom out on those responses and and look at them um, uh, and look at them in that very early response, you see that there's sort of a, a biphasic peak, which occurs at, at a roughly sort of five and 10 milliseconds after the pulse. And it looks very much like a, um, a motor evoke potential, which you record from hand muscles and is in a similar sort of amplitude. And we sort of showed as well that the, uh, that the size of these early responses increases the, the further down that you stimulate. So the closer that you stimulate to, to scout muscles, uh, the larger these responses uh, became. And we sort of concluded that uh, from this, that these large early responses were most likely a TMS evoked um, muscle response. And anyone who's had TMS over areas like the prefrontal cortex will, will know that, you know, that you definitely um, get quite strong muscle contractions uh, in, those, in those areas. Um, th this becomes really, really challenging actually uh, for recording the early EEG responses to TMS, um, particularly for, for some of these more lateral brain regions, because the, the size of this, this muscle response can be uh, several orders of magnitude larger than what we expect for brain responses. So this poses a real problem um, for sort of the, the signals within the, the first um, 50 to 100 milliseconds to be able to to be able to actually get what, um, to get at the, the, the neural response within these time windows. So we found different possible um, solutions to this and one was using a blind source separation method called independent component analysis. Now this is quite commonly used uh, in areas uh, like uh, magnetic resonance imaging to, to help separate out um, complex multi-dimensional uh, signals into their their component or their potential component uh, component sources and then what you can do is you can actually reconstruct uh, the signal uh, without those those uh, artifact sources in it so we look to see what the what components we could get if we if we ran ICA on our on our raw data and we sort of found that there were components that seemed to uh, reflect quite closely that, that early muscle response. So here we'd sort of chopped out the main parts and, and just kept the, the tail. Uh, we found that, that there were also some other components that seemed to correspond with the, the slow decays that can, cause, uh, that can occur in single electrodes due to the, the buildup of charges from the TMS pulse. We found that there were other components that seemed to, to link to, to time-locked blinks that can occur, particularly for, for prefrontal stimulation. We found that they mixed actually heavily if you included voluntary blinks into the, into the signal as well, that they all loaded onto to the same component. And also in this case, if you just provided um, a, a sham stimulation, and we found that there was uh, components that loaded onto both the sham simulation and the, the TMS signal, suggesting that these components might have reflected some kind of um, an auditory response. So what we showed is that if you reconstructed the signal um, without these components, so the, the raw signal here um, on the, the right-hand side in the left panel represents just the raw signal with all the artifacts in it. If you reconstructed the signal without those components, it looked quite different and was probably more in the range of what we'd expect from um, a physiological response to stimulation than if you didn't uh, than if you didn't sort of remove the signal. So suggesting that it was maybe getting the signal a bit closer to, to a physiologically reasonable signal um, than, than if you just left all of the, the artifact components in. However, there, there are a number of quite strong, uh, quite strong assumptions of independent component analysis. And one of the, the key ones is this idea that the, the signals, in order for, for ICA to, to work well and for it to be able to, to break the, the signals out accurately into, its, uh, into their component parts, that the, these, uh, the underlying signals need to be temporally independent. So what this means is that whatever um, changes that those signals have is that they, they occur um, in a way that, that is independent from, um, from the other different signals. So in an ongoing, uh, in an ongoing 
uh, recording, this is probably much more of a reasonable assumption. But when things are time locked to something like a TMS pulse or a stimulus, that, that assumption starts to potentially break down a little bit because now all of the events that you're interested in, interested in are by definition time locked. So you lose some of that temporal independence. But still, um, we know that neural responses to, to stimuli uh, tend not to be perfectly time locked and they tend to jitter a little bit. So the underlying assumption of using ICA in TMS research is that there's enough jitter in the, the neural responses compared to the artifact responses that the, that the analysis should be able to, to separate those two, those two out. Now, there's actually been some, some really nice uh, simulation work that's looked to see whether these assumptions actually hold up. So some work, um, again, um, out of Russell Moniemi's group with um, Julio Hernandez Pavon, where Julio actually included some known signals uh, into, uh, into the response before he did the ICA decomposition and then looked to see whether he could recover those signals. And what he found was that if the, the artifact, um, the muscle artifact in particular was too large, that you could recover the time course of the, the activity that you were interested in, but the, the actual spatial distribution of that activity was quite highly distorted. So what he found is that if you, um, that before you ran ICA, you actually needed to make sure that any of the really, really large responses were reduced um, sufficiently so that they weren't too large and if you did that, then you could recover uh, the, the responses quite well. Um, in, a, in a separate study, um, Johanna Metsoma uh, did another simulation where she in, uh, used some, some TMS EG data and actually completely reconstructed a signal where the, the entire signal was simulated. So both the artifacts and the neural data was simulated and she compared whether uh, the way that we typically do um, do ICA uh, with this data could actually recover all of the components. And here she was trying to recover 10 components. And she found that actually when you do this in her simulated data, that um, using it in the way that we typically use it doesn't actually work overly well. And there was only roughly four components that um, were that, that um, in the simulated data that they were actually able to, to, uh, to recover sufficiently. So these simulations actually suggest that it's possible that while ICA is, is sort of doing a fairly good job at, at suppressing the artifacts, it could actually still be uh, not turning the, the brain signals in a state that, uh, that is truly representative of, of what, they, um, what they actually are. So it might be a case that, that ICA is sort of getting us closer to the truth but still not entirely to the truth of what the actual um, brain response to, to stimulation is in these areas that, um, that, that result in these really high amplitude, large, uh, large artifacts. So th there have been some other um, methods that have been suggested and, and tested as a, opposed to ICA for, for removing these sort of artifacts. So one, um, again, from Risto's group looking um, from Hanamaki, she suggested this idea of signal space projection um, which is used quite commonly in MEG research. So the, the underlying idea here is that the, the muscle response exists in a, um, is a very, very high frequency response and therefore exists in a, a subspace of the signal where we don't expect to see neural signal. So typically it's, it's thought that, um, that, um, that uh, brain responses um, recorded by EG aren't greater than 100 hertz. So what Hana did was, was used um, uh, a version of a principal component analysis, which is related to independent component analysis, but slightly different. And she filtered the signal just into the high frequency components and decomposed uh, the data based on that. So under the assumption that uh, the signal within that space would only represent uh, the, the muscle activity. And what she found is that she could quite significantly suppress the muscle artifact um, well, really quite successfully. The downside was is that it also seemed to suppress um, a lot of the other activity that was near the site of stimulation. So here the site of stimulation was here. The raw version of this data had really large muscle artifacts. Those muscle artifacts are gone, but a lot of the brain activity is gone as well. The top team from Risto's group uh, sort of came up with an addition to this um, signal space projection where he used uh, what he calls source informed reconstruction to try and re-estimate the, the suppressed cortical activity. And using this method, he showed that 
in, in highly artifactual data that you're not only able to suppress the, the muscle artifact, but also able to record a sensible looking brain response um, in these very, very early time windows that seem to, to locate near where the, the TMS um, stimulation point was happening. So Thomas also, also uh, looked at uh, another technique which he calls sound, which uses um, a method uh, to, to look at individual electrodes and, and try and uh, find sources of, of noise which are electrode specific and suppress those, uh, those signals. So this in TMS EG recordings, this is particularly useful for artifacts like decay artifacts and noisy electrodes that can occur due to coil contact. Um, so this method, um, as you can see here, sort of um, some electrodes that have lots of uh, line noise or um, decay offsets uh, that they're able to, to reconstruct um, the, the likely neural response in those, those channels. And again, you can recover uh, sensible looking brain responses here that, that locate quite closely to the site of simulation. It's quite messy and highly artifactual data. So one of the, the major challenges of techniques that are constantly being um, updated uh, is that it's obviously very hard for, for most of us who, who don't have a strong uh, mathematics or, or coding background to actually use these methods and to evaluate them. So uh, a few years ago, we started a project called uh, the TMS EG Signal Analyzer or TESSA um, project. And the idea behind this project was to try and create a, um, a I guess, a uh, a collection of all of the, the methods that were being used in TMS EG analysis and present them in a way that where the code for these, um, these methods was standardized uh, and also that was available to people by making it accessible through a graphical user interface. So we built a plugin for EEG lab and then working with a number of different people um, which are over on the right hand side here in the first iteration of TESSA um, we were able to sort of pull together, I guess, all of the, the state of the art methods that were, were being used. And, and then this, what this essentially allows people to do is to build their own pipelines uh, for TMS EG analysis and potentially compare the, the effects of using different types of data cleaning methods on, on, how, um, on how that impacts their, their data. So um, more recently, Thomas and Mana uh, Biabani, one of my former students who's now a postdoc with, uh, with our group, um, have extended the, the toolbox to include um, both sound and SSP SIR. So we just that um, online, I think it was yesterday or the day before. So that's now available um, with the, so Tessa now has both the, the sound and SSP SIR um, functions in them as well. And, and for those of you who are out there that are, that are using um, or developing new methods and would like to have them uh, available through TESSA, please feel free to get in contact with me and um, be more than happy to work with you to, to make those available. Um, and just a shout out, well, there's another toolbox that we worked on recently called the Magnetic Simulator Interface Controller or, or MAGIC for short. So this is a toolbox which allows you to remotely control uh, your your different stimulators using using um, using MATLAB. So if you want to be able to, to change settings on your your stimulators from MATLAB, uh, you can do it with this toolbox. Okay, so assumption one: Can we reliably uh, record, recover the artifacts in EG recordings following TMS? This seems to probably depend a little bit on where you're stimulating. So if you're stimulating in areas where you don't uh, see these large muscle responses. Uh, and, and if you're careful with your preparation and avoid things like decay artifacts, then yes, you probably can um, quite reliably recover brain responses. It becomes a lot more tricky in the areas where the artifact responses are, quite, are a lot higher. And I, I think we still probably don't have a, um, a consensus within the field as to whether any of our, our methodological approaches can, can truly reliably recover the, the brain responses, particularly in those, those, early, um, those early time points. So I thought we'd move on to assumption two now, which is related more to perturbation research. In that the, the, um, so this um, assumption here is that the brain signals that we're recording from EEG um, are specifically occurring from the TMS interaction with the targeted cortical region. So I guess we've known for actually for quite a long time, actually probably one of the, the second or third publications uh, with TMS EEG actually showed that 
the, the, a large amount of the response that you uh, measure following TMS actually relates to the auditory response from the, the TMS click. So that really, really loud clicking noise that the, the coil gives off causes an auditory evoked potential, um, which is recorded with EEG. And that can be um, attenuated by, um, by, by moving the, the, the coil further away from the, the scalp. So it seems that there are both, there's both a, a air conducted component to this and also a vibration component from the, the coil contacting the, the head. Um, uh, Marcello Massimani and their group in their early studies uh, developed a, a masking protocol where they mixed in uh, white noise with um, the frequency um, components of the, the TMS click and uh, provided participants with, um, with a masking noise while they were receiving stimulation. And they sort of suggested that this, uh, this masking approach was, was fairly successful at attenuating the, these auditory evoked potentials. And in some further studies, um, so some other some other people, I guess, tried out this um, just the, using either the white noise or um, the full spectral masking noise, and putting things like a layer of foam in between the the coil to try and minimise the vibrations. I sort of suggested that that using these measure using these measures um, attenuated the the sensory responses to stimulation and seemed to. Um, I guess, uh, get them to a point where they were more or less negligible. And I guess this was kind of um, assumed to be the case by, by a, a sort of a large majority of the field for, for a number of years. However, um, a sort of a series of studies have, I guess, sort of challenged that, that view a little bit. And the first one that um, I thought really brought this to my attention was uh, the, the work by, by Jim Herring and Till Bergman, where they uh, stimulated the occipital cortex um, in their, their study that we discussed earlier about um, attentional, uh, the, the attention, the effects of attention on occipital excitability. But they also included an interesting control condition in this study where they also stimulated the shoulder as, I guess, a, um, a region that sort of uh, you can still hear the coil click, you still get a, a sensory response to the stimulation, but you're not actually stimulating the brain. And what they found was that for the early response, the, the you know the shoulder stimulation didn't really seem to, to to be very similar to the to the brain response. But certainly for the later components of the response, the the two types of stimulation actually look quite similar. So using a slightly more elaborate control condition, more recently uh, Virginia Condi and um, and Leo Tomasevich, uh, again with Till and Hartwig Ziedner. Um, I guess provided a, a slightly different uh, control condition where they actually electrically stimulated the scalp where the stimulation was occurring while providing a spacer between the TMS coil uh, and the head. So thereby both capturing the stimulation of the scalp um, as well as the, the auditory stimulation of, the, um, of the, the coil clicking. Importantly here, they also applied the, the, masking, method, the masking method, so the noise masking um, and the, the foam between the coil. And what they found was that when they compared stimulating either a frontal or a parietal region to their control condition, is that the the two uh, the two signals were actually quite highly correlated across time, particularly from um, around about fifty to sixty milliseconds onwards, but also with a reasonable um, reasonably high correlation early as well in some channels. And interestingly, more recently, this is um, a, a preprint that. Um, that, that I noticed uh, recently, when you separate those two out, so when you provide either electrical stimulation separately or auditory stimulation separately, both of those um, stimulations can evoke um, an N100 P180 like complex, which is, is very commonly observed in, in um, TMS evoked responses. So in some of our work, um, this work uh, undertaken by Marna as part of her PhD um, with my group, uh, we looked at to see whether a similar uh, a similar pattern was observable following shoulder stimulation and stimulation of the primary motor cortex. We found a very similar uh, very similar finding here in that, um, particularly over frontal and central uh, electrodes, and for for later time points, that the the two signals were very highly correlated, suggesting that a lot of the the um, the or some at least of the, the brain's response to motor stimulation can be explained by, by incoming sensory signals.
Um, what was also evident, though, that over the side of stimulation, that there was uh, there was some signal that was seemed to be independent from the the sensory response. And Marna tested a number of different methods for trying to to disentangle those those responses and recover, um, I guess, that independent response. And she found that actually adapting Thomas's um, uh, signal space projection and sourcing form reconstruction algorithm that um, that seemed to provide a, a reasonable estimate of uh, the, the brain's response to, to um, stimulation of the motor cortex. And it seemed that this was actually a little bit more localised than what is potentially uh, concluded when you, you look at the entire response. But this one kind of suggests that there's potentially, uh, I guess, just a, a global um, response to stimulation that, that uh, is, doesn't really depend on where you stimulate and is, uh, is more related to the sensory uh, response to stimulation than the, the cortical response. And again, some of, some of um, our recent work um, stimulating prefrontal and parietal regions sort of suggests that perhaps the very early response, so the, the response within the first, mil, uh, first 50 milliseconds, tends to localise more to the, to the site where of stimulation. And then that sort of over time, uh, the, those signals seem to come together to reflect what, what appears to be um, a fairly generalised response to, to stimulation. More recently, it's sort of shown that this very high frequency early response um, seems to very closely track where you stimulate um, across a couple of different Areas, but uh, just with a general sensory response, so in terms of the shock uh, response, that doesn't seem to be becomes more sensitive uh, later after stimulation. So, so why is this important? Like, why do we need to know uh, whether there's whether the, the response is sensory as opposed to from where we, we stimulate? Um, I think this is sort of captured nicely um, in, in uh, another finding from, from Michael Doe from Peter Endicott's group we've been working with. Um, and this all comes down to, I guess, to how you interpret what the, the outcome of the, the signal is. So what Michael did in his study was he applied uh, CTBS, so feed burst stimulation, to the primary motor cortex. He then assessed TMS evoked potentials both before and after stimulation and looked to see whether there was a change um, in the TP response. And he found that there was a, um, a change in the amplitude of the, the response at 45 milliseconds um, after um, T, um, after the in the TMS evoked response, so one conclusion that would, I guess could be drawn from this is that the CTBS is changing the the, the motor cortex's response to TMS, um, suggesting some kind of a, a plasticity response. But Michael also included a, a shoulder control condition in in his um, in his study. What he found was that the change in the N45 was also shown in the shoulder condition. So this changes the interpretation of this result um, uh, quite a lot, I think. So instead of potentially representing a change in the, the actual motor cortex output, this potentially suggests that CTBS is, is causing some kind of change in sensory integration. So really, really important to be able to understand whether the responses or the changes that we're seeing with the condition are reflected, I guess, in what we're generally interested in. So are they reflecting a change in the property of the region that we've stimulated or the network that we've stimulated? Or do they just re uh, represent some other kind of um, general sensory uh, or change in sensory processing, um, which might also be reflected in TMS EG recordings? So th there's been, um, I guess, a lot of uh, response to, to these current challenges to the field and a couple of recent, um, uh, I guess, editorial responses from, from a large, um, large groups within the field. So I guess in response particular to, to, to Virginia and Leo's paper, um, I guess a number in the field pointed out that, you know, there are some differences in the way that um, the responses are between different groups. So some groups seem to get this really, really um, large amplitude, high frequency response. And, and again, I think a number of us here sort of were suggesting that maybe these responses um, are not necessarily sensory responses. So there are certainly um, certainly seem to be maybe some brain specific responses in TMS EEG and in his group came back pointing out that that might be true but currently um, a lot of the the data that is coming out from certain groups and this is some of the data actually from from our group um, doesn't seem to have that really large um, high amplitude early response so 
Um, I think what these discussions and, and these debates have really highlighted is that there's still quite a lot of disparity between methods um, across different labs at the moment in terms of how TMS EG is being conducted, um, which I think is really um, preventing the, the field from sort of moving forward and from TMS EG to be, becoming a really mainstream technique at the moment. Um, uh, Sylvia Casarotto and Matteo Fecchio and, and the guys from Marcello Massimini and Mario Rossanova's group um, are working on, on getting together um, a, a, a graphical user interface of how they go about setting up their experiments to get those really high amplitude um, early responses to, to, to TMS EG. And this involves very carefully checking the coil position and the responses while you're actually performing and setting up the experiment making sure that you're getting those responses before continuing on with the experiment. So this is um, from a, an abstract from, from the, the SFN conference last year, and hopefully um, I think these guys are hoping to release this toolbox pretty soon. What are take-home messages from today? So I think um, what, we can, uh, what we've shown is that, you know, concurrent TMS EG does provide information on, on how the brain responds to TMS. But I guess what we've also shown is that, you know, a lot of that response um, can actually, uh, or seems to be related more to the sensory input from the, uh, the TMS pulse as opposed to actually the, the TMS uh, stimulation of the cortical circuits or networks themselves. And I guess that the key implication, I think, of, of, these, um, of this conclusion is that uh, for, for a lot of the published studies that are out there that haven't included um, adequate control conditions, it's actually kind of unclear whether the changes in the, the TMS evoke responses that we've seen in these, in these studies are truly reflective of the, the region that's been stimulated, a change in the properties of the region, or whether they potentially just um, might reflect more general changes in sensory processing and under those, um, those different experimental manipulations. So the I think is that it, it is possible to uncover site-specific effects um, of TMS using EG, but there is a big but to that though. And this, you know, this it requires quite careful experimental setup. So trying to maximize the, the brain responses and, and the signal to noise ratio. And that probably involves, um, you know, uh, specialized methods for, for setting up experiments that are not currently available widely, but are hopefully coming soon. And hopefully that'll be something that the field can really work around to try and come up with a, a very solid method for, for recording those responses. And the second is that, you know, you really need to be very careful with how you clean and analyze the data and that in some cases you do need specialized analysis approaches, particularly for regions where there's large muscle artifacts or, or other large artifacts. So there are currently, these methods are, um, are openly available and we're continuing to, to try and make those um, available as available as possible. But I still think there's no real consensus on what the, the, the best approach is at the moment for, for trying to, to claim this data. And um, certainly I think the next stage for this kind of research is to start doing more comparative studies between uh, different um, analysis pipelines to try and understand which ones uh, are gonna be the most successful. And finally, I think it's, it's really important that, that all of us um, take a step back and when we're designing our studies, make sure that we're being very careful in the way that we construct those studies and that we include uh, sufficient and appropriate experimental control conditions that, um, that will allow us to, to, to adequately exclude whether just general sensory activity is a possible explanation for any um, of the findings that, that we see. Um, the challenge here is that, you know, it's currently unclear as to how site-specific sensory artifacts are, so that makes it difficult to know what the best way is to construct these control conditions. But um, this is, I know there are a number of labs that are currently working on this, and I'm hopeful that sort of within the next year or two, uh, we should have some more, uh, some more solid data on, on, on how to, to adequately construct control conditions. But finally, I think, you know, that despite all of these challenges, the using EG really does greatly improve or has the potential to greatly improve our understanding of how TMS interacts with the brain. And I think, you know, as we overcome some of these challenges that are, I guess, currently um, potentially holding the field back a little bit, as we overcome them, I think, you know, TMS EG really will become um, a major tool and technique that is, is used to sort of shape the next uh, decade I saw decade or so of, of brain stimulation research.
So if I want to quickly um, thank and acknowledge all of the, the the groups and the people that I've worked with over the, the last few years and have all contributed to various aspects of the, the data that um, I've presented there. So my, my current team on the left and the, the guys that I've sort of been fortunate to work with um, in the centre there. Um, also, thank you to the funding sources and finally as well, just some links to, to some of the software that we have, um, that we've made available as well. Okay, so thank you. Sorry that. Sorry about the, the the slow start there with a few technical problems, and I've gone a little bit over time, but um, more than happy to to field some questions now. Great. Thanks so much for your time, Nigel, and thanks so much for being so honest and informative and giving us a nice thorough summary of the lowdown on TMS EG at the moment. Yeah, no worries at all. <laughs> cool. So, uh, dear Professor Rogach, could you please describe the procedure for determining the hotspot for a transcranial evoked potential? Yeah, that's a, a great question. I guess this sort of um, this goes to uh, I guess what uh, Sylvia and, and Matteo and the Milan group have I guess been working towards is uh, designing a method for doing that. And I guess that what, the way that they do it, which I think is really quite quite nice is they actually have uh, online averaging um, they actually visualize their evoked potentials um, online so they will provide say 10 or 15 stimuli to a region they'll then check their recordings they'll see what they look like they'll see whether there's any large artifacts if there is they'll change the coil position to to try and make sure that they're not getting those large artifacts um, then once they've sort of found um, an area where they're, they're not getting that, they then check to see whether they're seeing those really large early evoke responses. And they'll sort of make small changes and manipulations to the, the coil angle and the coil position until they see those, those large responses and they might turn the stimulation up um, as well. So the, the challenge there is that I guess you need to be able to, to, to have the software that, that can do that. And as I mentioned, that's not publicly available at the moment, but I think those guys are working on making that publicly available. I'll just also point out as well that I guess the, the, the downside to this method and this technique is that you know there's actually not very many areas um, where you don't see large data responses and you see these responses quite clearly in raw data. So you really are sort of restricted to, to midline stimulation sites um, for this method at the moment. So I guess that's where some of the, the processing um, or the cleaning work that, that some of us have been doing uh, becomes important when you're looking at, at regions that are more lateral, like the prefrontal cortex and those kind of regions where you can't avoid the muscle artifacts. So there we need to develop and, and see whether we can, I guess, develop robust processing methods that will allow us to do something similar in those regions. Brilliant. Thanks so much. Uh, I got another one. Uh, hi, Nigel. What are your thoughts on using an exponential function to regress out some of the early TMS artifacts from the signal? Yeah, I think, you know, that, that approach, um, you know, potentially uh, can work well for, for some of the decay style artifacts that, that seem to have that exponential or double exponential shape to them. We've played around with that a little bit. Um, I mean, we sort of had mixed success with it. Um, it seemed to work in some cases quite well um, and not so well in other cases. Um, but there's another really interesting paper which uh, the, the first author alludes me at the moment where they actually use a slightly more sophisticated uh, model for developing their, their exponential functions um, uh, that was sort of based on the, uh, the way that the current is potentially stored at the, the, um, the gel electrode um, interface. And that seemed to do better than just using a, an exponential or a double exponential function. So I think their code for that is, is is available and we might look to try and get that available in Tessa at some point as well. But, you know, so I think that could potentially work well if you've got really large decay, uh, decay components that you're trying to remove. Brilliant. Thanks for that. So we've just got two more now. Is that okay? Just take two more questions? Of course, of course. Uh, can you please elaborate on which regions are more susceptible to muscle artifacts as a result of TMS stimulation so it is more reliable to do TMS EEG? Yeah, certainly. So, I mean, pretty much any of the, 
any of the lateral areas, um, uh, tend, anywhere around the outside of the head where you've got the, the, the scalp muscles and the facial muscles uh, will typically have a very, very strong response. So really the only areas that you can typically avoid those um, are along the midline. So that's sort of, you know, uh, between sort of the, the CZ and, uh, sorry, the, the Z and the, the one and two electrodes. So it's actually quite a narrow band um, for most people where you can avoid those um, those muscle artifacts. And, you know, in some people, I think I'm one of those people, it, it's actually, you know, pretty much doesn't matter where you stimulate with me, you seem to get some kind of a, a muscle artifact. So I guess depending on, on variation in an individual anatomy um, and, you know, the, as well the threshold, so, you know, if you need to really turn the simulation up to get a response, you're more likely to get a, a muscle response then as well. So, you know, that can be quite challenging um, in some people. And, and it does, as I said, the one downside to that approach is that it does really restrict where you can stimulate to to avoid the, the muscle response. But, you know, it's a trade-off, I guess, between whether, you know, you have, you're tightly locked to a certain region for the questions that you're trying to answer or whether you have a bit of flexibility with that. Great stuff. Thank you very much. And now the the last question, because I know it's getting on in your evening now. I didn't actually realise the time difference was that big. It's it's enormous. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, hi, Nigel. Can you give any advice for aspiring students who would like to take their first st steps into the realm of EEG and TMS research? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I guess my advice would be uh, to to really take your time and get to know the technique and the data very well. So it's not an easy method. It's, it's not easy to combine the, these two methods and do these experiments well. So it's quite easy actually just to whack a TMS coil on an EEG cap and stimulate and get something and, and you know, and try and draw some conclusions to it. But, you know, to, to, to do this in a way that's really rigorous and, and, you know, you can be confident that what you're getting is reflecting what you think it is, is actually quite challenging. So things that I've found helpful, one was learning MATLAB and learning how to code. Um, so it doesn't necessarily need to be MATLAB, it could be any coding language, but you know, really getting to understand how to use those tools and use well. Um, sort of upskilling in signal processing as well. Um, I think, you know, having a, a really strong knowledge of how artifacts can affect signals and as well how trying to remove artifacts can affect signals both in good ways and bad ways. Um, is, is really, really important. Um, from a practical perspective, you've really just got to get in there and do it. Um, get in there, get your hands dirty, make some recordings, make sure you, you look at them um, and, you know, uh, really check what you're doing the, the whole way through and, and check your data quality uh, a lot. So, you know, the, the, the key thing with, with TMS EG recordings is that the EG setup needs to be really, really good. Uh, so by that, I mean, you need to have very, very low impedances. Uh, you need to spend uh, more time than you would usually making sure that that um, all of your electrodes are well gelled up and you've got good connections and, and they have um, strong response, uh, uh, good, strong uh, and clear signals. So I think those two things, um, and then I guess, you know, as these new methods and new tools become available, sort of staying on top of those, and, and trying to, to make sure that you're continually updating your skills as they become available, I think is, is really, really important. So hopefully that, that's kind of answered uh, your question there. Um, and, uh, and again, look, in terms of the processing side of things, obviously we've done a, a manual which sort of describes how to use TESSA to design your own pipelines. So, you know, there's, uh, um, there's a lot of information in that manual that hopefully people can use to try and learn how to do some of the, the cleaning methods. But um, I guess, yeah, my, my overall advice would be just to, to make sure you're always checking your data. Uh, and, and I guess if you can, try to make your data as clean when you're recording it, um, as opposed to trying to clean it afterwards. So it's always better to have cleaner data at the start as opposed to, to trying to clean it at the end. Great stuff. Thanks so much, Nigel. We've had one more come in. And I think it'd be good if the delegates got the answer. Uh, they have a comment on the Conde paper. Yes. Uh, they use electrical stimulation for the realistic sham. Yep. But the TMS coil is known to be a tapping sensation rather than an electrical one. 
Yeah. This can involve different skin receptors. Are you aware of any sham controls which can reproduce the tapping sensation of a TMS pulse? Yeah, and I guess that's something which they noted in the, the, the Condi article is that, you know, that the, the, the sharpness of the sensation of the electrical stimulation was quite different, um, I guess, to the, the stimulation. Um, so it's more focal uh, than, than what the TMS sensation was. So it is likely to be slightly slightly different. But kind of different sham coils that, uh, that are kind of around um, at the moment. And, you know, I guess they use various different methods to try and mimic the, the, the or well, some use uh, methods to try and mimic the, the sensory response to the, to the, simula to the simulation. Um, short answer is I'm not aware. I'm aware that they're out there. I'm not aware how good they are. Um, and whether that they uh, they will give like a sufficient uh, sham response, and I guess you know this is the one of the real challenges at the moment is I guess trying to understand what is a um, you know what is an adequate sensory control condition, um, and I guess you know th there are also potentially scenarios where if you're keeping the the site of stimulation constant, that um, you know maybe and you using, I guess, something within your experimental condition to, to alter that you could assume that the sense responses might remain inconsistent. So there's other ways, I guess, of designing control conditions as opposed to exactly matching the, the sensory input. But, you know, something that, that can exactly match that sensory input, I think will be, if someone can achieve that, that'd be fantastic. Um, and if anyone out there knows of anything or, or has tried some, something out where they can, they find that the, the sham response is indistinguishable from a real response i'd certainly love to hear about that as well well great thank you as well we'll round it up there and i'd just like to thank you again for giving such a good talk and giving up some of your evening to help us all understand a bit more about tms eg so thank you again we all really appreciate it uh no worries at all rory and, and again yeah uh thanks very much for having me um and you know for, for all of you guys out there that are listening um, you know, if you do want to chat about this more or, um, or talk about TMSCG more, do feel free to drop me a line. Great. Thank you so much, Nigel.